fault in the two, the mighty scholars have been made for the minister of the MR and research English education. As a part of the MR, offered tips in a minor settings each six papers. Cure applications by MME and Brigade Flat by MK was a safe set. I'm not an athlete, and we have a trolley on my car. We have an ego of scuss. Uh, I'm from the university, and Dr. Rosam from the university. Our format is a little different, uh, because Alan is going to, first of all, give us a side edition of his paper. And so we can go that and uh, come back to the discussion. Okay, I'm going to try and just rush right through. I made a few uh, notes here in the interest of brevity. Um, first, I have a few disclaimers. Um, first one is that our lab at Xerox is not a product development lab. So anything that I may talk about should not be construed as future plans of Xerox. And probably is, is not. It's hard to... Um, the kinds of things that, that we are doing there are to are just sort of what you might call freewheeling investigation. The, the lab itself is set up as sort of a Bell Labs kind of place. Uh, the people in, in our group aren't educators or psychologists. Most of us are. The backgrounds are essentially former artists, musicians, writers, and computer scientists. And usually people fall into several of those categories. Also, on the paper, um, what you're looking at is a first draft. It happens to be the fifth paper I wrote for this conference. The first four used English, and it seems to be a, a bad way of trying to communicate with, with uh, people who, who know English a lot better than I do. So I, fit of desperation, I got 40 packs of Polaroid film and started wailing away at our equipment. And this paper is essentially a picture show of the kinds of things that we're doing. Um, the, I would hope that you don't copy it if you possibly can avoid it, I will send you a, a better one. Um, main reason is that I forgot to put in the references to Winnie the Pooh, uh, all kinds of possible copyright violations and everything else, since it is used as examples in there. Okay. Um, when we started this thing off, we were very influenced by Piaget, Moore, Papert, Dewey even, looking at active ways for trying to help kids to learn how to think or to perfect their own thinking skills. And the Papertian kinds of things, as most of you know, are to try and give a child an environment that's active like him. It's an environment in which thinking and creativity are the natural kinds of things that are done. I disagreed with uh, Jeremy Finn this morning when he said the bad way to learn French is to get put in, Fran get put in a, a French beach. That's a great way to learn French, because you have to. Uh, you have real rewards for doing transactions in that kind of environment. And, and the fact that kids don't learn mathematics or creative thinking skills any better than they learn French in this country may mean that we're just not giving them an environment for that. Anyway, that's the Papert idea. And the question is, what kind of an environment can you come up with? So we thought, OK, tool. We'll create a, we'll make a tool to do all of this. And after a while, we realized that it really wasn't a tool. In fact, the ideas surrounding tools are wrong because they're things that stir existing media. Okay, What you really want is to, if you have something that is basically a new medium, it's like paper now, Okay, then you can create tools that stir that particular medium. Uh, we don't understand what this medium is, but I'd like to try and give you an idea of some of the things that we've done and some of the plans that we have, and just sort of let it go with that. I can say that the stuff I'm going to show you is science fiction right now, but no new top technologies have to be invented in order to make this come about. I believe it's not more than, than um, two years off. Okay, And when I mean two years off, I mean the ability to have a device that will sell, low, sell for a price that's low enough so that almost every that they'll sell for the same kinds of prices that color TVs do, okay, and perhaps lower. So let's sort of see what it is. You've already got that on. Can we have the lights down? And I'll grab the clicker if I don't drink myself. You OK? Well, <clears throat> this is uh, an existing device. It's a thing that Hewlett-Packard Hewlett calls a 
pocket electronic slide rule. And it turns out that the way they decided to make it is so that it would fit into uh, Bill Hewlett's shirt pocket. That was the way it was, was designed. It had to do everything that a slide rule would do, except to 10 places. And they actually spent um, uh, almost an extra year on this thing to keep it to those size specifications. It has batteries, and it can indeed be used on the, on the grass. The power that it has and the size, portability and everything else, make it something completely different, so different that Hewlett Packard expects to sell three million of these in the next five years. People who would never buy a calculating machine of any kind buy these things for $400. Okay, so quantitative changes, if you make them large enough, are qualitative changes. Um, here's our conception of this gadget we call the DynaBook, also designed to be used in the grass. We don't have to worry about what's in it. It suffices to say that we designed the outside package first. So we want it to be no larger than a standard notebook. It's about 9 by 12. And we tried to make the specifications for it, stylistic ones, ones that had to do with the kind of quality that we wanted, with the idea that we would uh, try to beat the technolo whatever technologies needed to be beaten uh, totally into submission in order to fulfill the insides of the gadget. And that, in fact, is what we were doing. So the idea here, it, whoops, the I idea here is that it's supposed to be something like active paper. Okay, uh, it's not supposed to be worse than paper in any reasonable way. It's one of the problems with modern technologies. You always come up with something worse. Um, we wanted to be able to handle things dynamically rather than statically the way paper did, but it, at, no, at no real loss in quality. So basically, it has a display in which you can see things. You can think of it as being like a television display. Uh, means for entering things. It has a, you, you can barely see it, a way for entering drawings. And it has a removable hunk of storage that will store one 500-page book, okay, or a million characters. Runs on batteries, and you can carry it with it. It's portable by my definition of portability, okay, which is that you can carry something else, too. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what you can do with it. Um, in order to check out a few things, we decided to simulate it using current computer technology. So everything you're going to see from now on, and every, all the pictures in the paper are actual uh, photographs taken at our lab. Okay, the simulation is, a, is a, in some sense, a real simulation. Okay, here's an example of the kind of display for text. Now, because this is an active medium, we can have any font that we want. The text files, for instance, we have almost all of this book typed in. We can look at this um, piece of text uh, using any font that we, that we wish. And fonts, of course, have a great qualitative uh, effect on the way people read things, the way they think about them. It's a well-known kind of thing. Here's exactly the same text seen in Bodoni font. Okay, and the change from one font to another is as fast as clicking this slide. Here's another one. Okay, here's, here's one with italics. Now, we, the, the gadget that we built can display in color, but the resolution is so poor on color monitors that you get a poor effect. So we haven't done anything further in color since then. And even more, because it's an active medium, the user can design his own way of looking at his information. Okay, here I was dissatisfied with <coughs> looking at Winnie the Pooh, as a matter of fact, in that other font. And here I'm just drawing in the outline of a font character. And here is what it will look like, actual size. And here is the, the agony of the ecstasy shown in that font, designed in about, takes about an hour and a half to do one that tricky. Okay, here is Winnie the Pooh. And another thing we're interested in doing is allowing people to substitute iconic reference for text uh, reference. For instance, uh, substituting 
picture of the bear for the, for the word bear and some bees for the word bees. Now this, the, the idea here is that this is a pliable kind of medium that has the, if, if you want to contrast it to paper, it's dynamically erasable much better than paper is. Okay, you can have anything. Now here, again, is a thing that we are experimenting with autistic kids, or semi-autistic kids, is the idea of personalizing your own font. So here's the very same text of Winnie the Pooh in my handwriting. Okay, the idea is it's yours. It's, it's hot. It's a hot medium rather than a cold one. Okay, another thing we're interested in doing is some non-standard fonts. These are described in the paper. This is the Pittman ITA kind of thing. Okay, again, this was not built into the device. It was something that we decided to do uh, quite a while after the device had been built. But it's, it's a very slippery kind of gadget because you can make it do uh, a lot of things. There's seeing a lot of the information. We're using very small characters. But, of course, you want to be able to draw. One of the principles we had in designing this thing was that you should be able to have a balance. Again, it's a qualitative thing. You want to have a balance between art and skill. That's a thing I alluded to this morning. This is just uh, religious doctrine. Uh, but you want to be able to manipulate things, to feel them. You want to be able to do skill kinds of things. You would like to be able to manipulate things directly. You'd also like to manipulate them indirectly. Here I'm directly drawing in and editing. And I'm seeing it in two different sizes here. Okay, now this is a picture editor. You may have heard of text editors. This is a picture editor which I can sketch into. Space War. Okay, Space War is a game that you would like to animate. You draw your own spaceships in and make them move around. There's a section in the paper that describes that. Another thing we tried was a painting program. Whoops, I promised I would never would not say the word program. I managed to write this paper without saying either the word computer or program. Because computers, people think of as big uh, card gobbling, Fortran executing kinds of monsters, whereas this is a, a completely different kind of thing. Here's a painting program. Again, the, the screen is completely parametric. Any area on the screen can be used as a paint pot. Here we supplied some and some brushes of different sizes. OK. Here's a tone painting seen as texture in the large size and a tone in the small size. It was done by picking up, using the stylus, picking up a brush size like that, dipping it into the paint pot, and layering it on. And again, it's positive editing. You can go in and change. This stuff is laid in over the top. This happens to be an executive vice president of Xerox. is on the critter path of the machine. And we have done the sketching. is very easy to do because, again, you positively erase. Erasing is negative. You erase by laying new stuff over. And here's one that works real well. The Cookie Monster from Sesame Street. And we have this fellow, Hagrid King Trump, out of Cena. But this is not done in our lab. But these are, again, computer active information manipulator generated pictures. They're what you would see if you happen to look at this scene with a TV camera, except there is no TV camera and there is no scene. What exists is a semantic model of what the scene is constructed of. The computer simply produces the million dots in color necessary. Because it's a three-dimensional scene, you can look at it from another point of view instantly. OK, back to this little gadget. How am I doing on time? I don't want to. Uh, okay. All right. um, what do you do with it? Well, the idea is you want to do as much as you possibly can. Now, there are better examples in the book. I'll just give you an idea of what, what things look like when you get on. When you step up to, the, to this, your little Dyna book, what you have is essentially a dy dynamic dictionary of all of the things that you ever wanted to have placed. 
stored by their name. So here's something called before, here's something called blocks, countdown, count up, draw, draw man, you know, so on. They can be either text like a, a story you're working on, a poem, which you can dynamically edit as described in the paper, or they can be uh, a set of actions with which the machine itself will evaluate. And in fact, the, I think that's almost the end. For instance, this particular thing, which particular definition, which is called spaceship, is a series of actions that will animate one of those one of those spaceships. <clears throat> okay, if that'll cause it to fly around the, the screen under your own control. Now, the interesting thing with kids. See if I can get to the end here. Yes. The interesting thing about kids is that they take to this like crazy. They glom onto it like TV. And in the five years or so of uh, studies that have been done by people getting kids to cause a, an information manipulator like this to do things for them have been quite remarkable. They start off Papert, for instance, starts off with a turtle. It's a device that sits on the floor and has a magic marker that can drop out of its rear end. If you say forward 10, the turtle clanks forward 10 notches. If the pen happens to be down, it leaves a track. So if you say right 90, it turns right 90. If you say forward 10, it goes forward 10 more notches. Do it a few more times and you have a square. Okay, the, the important thing is that the kid has done something that he wants to do, but in doing it, he has exercised uh, the, one of the most important things, I think, in human thinking, and that is the exercise of strategies and looking ahead, planning, taking something that's complicated and knocking it down into simpler things, and so on. So the idea behind this kind of, um, I, I hesitate to call it education, because it really isn't. It's not instruction, either. What you're providing the kid is an environment in which he can do things that appeal to him, but in which he's le learning the kinds of things you would like him to learn. Um, another thing that's done, to give you an idea, is this is basically a structural approach for people who are interested in, in structure. The, the thing I mentioned in the other room that's puzzled people for a long time, and that is, uh, if Skinner was right, why is it that when a kid is reading a story and he comes to you and asks you what a, what a word means, why does, why does he not come back after you tell him what the word means? Almost never will a kid come back. Okay? He's, ready to, he's ready to learn it. The story has produced a structure in which he can fit that meaning. On the other hand, if you try and teach him that word out of context, you have to run him through the old Skinner box to get the S-shaped learning curve on that word. He doesn't have any reason to learn it. He doesn't have any structure to fit, fit it into. So one of the things that we're doing is taking two very interesting structures, actually three, that is, the idea of writing these actions, the structure of pictures, and music, and combining them all together. Now, music and, and the language which is used to express these series of actions have the same structure. Okay, a, a musical score is a, is a set of instructions for a human interpreter. It has all of this. I hesitate to use the word computer again, but it has all of the attributes of a computer program. That's what it is, except it's interpreted by a human. They have different names for the leaves on the trees, but they have the same structure. And what the kids are learning here is to structure things without worrying about what the surface is. This is why I was arguing against the template thing. The template thing may appear if you don't do something else, but uh, what, what you get here is sort of a renaissance man effect. The kid is, gets used to, to ignoring. He's making up n his own names for things all along. What he's doing is ignoring syntactic structure. And he's going deep into the way, things, the way things are, taking them apart, trying to fit them into a semantic kind of relationship. Now, of course, nobody knows whether this works or not. I'm not what we're doing is we are not solving anybody's problem here, OK, because we don't know what the problem is. Um, what we're doing is simply moving on as intuitively and quickly as we possibly can to see whether this is whether these ideas are actually real. 
or whether they're just another figment of uh, people who are, people's imagination who are in, interested in helping kids. Uh, I'll just say one more thing, and that is that we are building <coughs> 10 or 12 non-portable machines, but which have exactly the same functions as the things that I've shown you. And we'll be going out with kids uh, next year, so we'll find out. This machine that I talked about is still about two years away. So, right. very good. Let's uh, hear from our discussants, and uh, would you like to begin, Yap, yeah, please? Sure. In the year 2000, if there are any graduate students left and they have an historical sense, they probably will go back over the notes of this meeting and some of them might say, that's funny. On the day the Diner Book was introduced to the NCTE, there always were also people concerned with such issues as responsive to literature and philosophy of education. And to their minds, that might be quite difficult to tie together. Uh, an immediate application of the Diner Book, as uh, I was viewing the slides, and that's about as much information as I have about it, uh, that's as much as you do, uh, seems to be that football coaches could cut down on pre-season injuries drastically by not playing a war game, but a football game. I can see application. We could program all kinds of defensive and offensive moves and find out how bad a tackle would be and what stress on the bones might occur if the tackle was made away. It was. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting uh, thing. I'm not valuing uh, in my descriptor, I think. And I honestly don't know uh, where it will take us. I think that it is true that miniaturization, as is shown by those calculators, uh, though it, it may not uh, make true the statement that uh, increased quantity uh, will or decrease quantity. What was it again? Quantity would be. Uh, many, in many many kinds of things, and uh, a large enough quantitative change introduces a qualitative change. Yeah, I, you know, that's, you can quibble about that, but I, I definitely believe uh, that if computer applications in instruction, and I'm limiting myself to that now, rather than go to the domain of uh, environment in a more general sense as uh, Alan has used it, if computer applications are going to be any reality at all, uh, we must get rid of a great deal of logistical problems. Uh, CIA, CAI has had a long uh, <laughs> history and an unfortunate one in a sense, and that goes for both. Uh, there are beautiful systems. The fact that Alan is able to uh, simulate the functions that his Dyna book uh, will contain does mean that we do have these capabilities. Uh, one of the systems that is not much publicized yet, uh, the Plato 4 in Illinois is very advanced, has a great deal of flexibility as opposed to other systems that we know of, and yet uh, getting students to get in contact with it involves so many problems uh, that I don't really think that we'll get a long way with it until we miniaturize. That's just one thought. Uh, I understand that Alan has to leave somewhat later on the program, and I'm going to make a few suggestions about uh, some of the statements he makes in his uh, presentation here that may be just errors or I misunderstand them, but if you're going to rewrite, you may sure. think about that. Uh, on the page where the discussion of special funds is, I find a few statements uh, that I don't understand. Uh, ITA encourages decomposition and subfocalization, both barriers to rapid reading. Okay. Also, acquisition of language in children seems to be on the word and sentence level with little attention to grammar and almost no attention to morphology. Mm -hmm. Now, unless you're saying something that's not there right now in my mind, I think that's a uh, patently uh, untrue statement in the sense that uh, studies like of Burko, that's just one example, show that even children as young as four year old uh, do acquire rules of uh, morphology even to the point that they will uh, put the correct uh, morphemes and pluralizations of nonsense words. So mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, that's if simply I think you ought to give consideration to that statement. Uh, if you want to react to it right now, fine. If it's something. Well, 
Um, let's take the first one first. It's true that, that the, well, first I should say, let's put in my own, in my own opinion here, because the, we have to admit that the collections on research done about reading are really pre presupposed with those kinds of things too. At least uh, they all can't be true. So they must be the opinion of the authors. Um, this is just yet another one. Um, um, but rapid readers seem to uh, seem to not decompose the the words. They read it like Chinese, as I alluded in there. And ITA definitely encourages decoding and and looking at the phonology of words. The other thing is that the fact that four-year-olds are learning mor morphology is not nearly as interesting as one and a half-year-olds learning language to me. And the way they learn it is not through morphology or syntax, but through the idea of words and objects and concatenating them together to make sentences. That's their atomic structure. Again, that's only my opinion. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing that Burkle was not in reading research. Uh, I, you know, I want to drop the point because this sure, evidence. Well, I can't prove it any more than he can. Uh, he can, she can. Uh, but anyway, I, I definitely uh, think that there may be you know, a great many instructional uh, applicabilities of uh, a Dyna book uh, like this. Uh, the fact that children can manipulate uh, things is in itself uh, a factor which is going to be of import. Studies have shown that uh, attitudinal interests uh, in term, in, with CAI systems are pretty permanent. Uh, kids' uh, levels of uh, interest will stay with it. Uh, even after prolonged interaction with such systems. So there's no reason to believe that this even more versatile uh, uh, machine will, uh, in that sense, be a strong instructional component. I don't believe that the instruction is the issue, though. I didn't mention the word instruction. I, I know. And the, of course, it can be used for that, and, I, and there's no way to prevent it being used for that, but it seems like instruction has... Well, again, here's another wild statement, but uh, it's not clear that instruction is the most uh, reasonable way of getting kids to learn something. As a better way might be getting them to become whatever it is that, that you want them to learn. Uh, the, my, again, I just believe that the stylistic, the ability to take something, take a poem, for instance, and as somebody was mentioning this morning, you change a word in it. Well, what about changing one of the things that we did, and I couldn't put it in the paper because of copyright violations, was, for instance, change all the he's in Winnie the Pooh to she. Reads very differently. Or go in and transform uh, Christopher Robin into Eleanor. Okay, and, and, you know, diddle with it. And this is something that you can do to get an idea of, of how, how easy changes lead to big effects quantitative, uh, qualitatively. I, the, one of the things mentioned in the paper is that Papert's kids were discovered to, to, to sneak in to use the text editor on the system simply to do their English compositions because they could change them with very little penalty. They didn't have to, to type them out again. The machine would do that for them. And Papert trapped every transaction that they made without them knowing it on the stories that they were writing on these things. And it's, it's, it's a very interesting way of seeing how a kid puts a story together, what kind of changes he makes to it, how does he improve it, when he doesn't have to pay for the, the penalty of doing it. I think that's, that to me is a heck of a lot more interesting than instruction. Uh, in fact, Papert's kids, this is a, a real a laugh, but Papert's kids actually write their own CAI. As when they want to learn multiplication, they sit down and write themselves a little multi multiplication drill program. And Papert's thing is that, mul that CAI is one of the 20 things you get kids to do with a computer. Yeah. The thing yeah. is if, okay. I, I guess I acknowledge all that, but I don't think that the uh, emergence of the, the dining book will do away with schools right away, and I'm just... I looking, don't want it to. I, I'm just <coughs> looking at the possibility of uh, thinking of its applications there. Uh, the more interesting point, though, is that uh, unless uh, there's any good programs to be put in the file, hey, Alan didn't use the word program, uh, this will just be a very short-lived uh, thing. That's right. That's why, the, that's why you want the kids to be able to... See, the difference between this kind of thing and Play-Doh is profound. 
you cannot write a, a, a child cannot write a program on Plato. He has to do what it does, or he can't do anything. And one of the problems is that Plato has a has a lack of instructional material. Somebody has to write that stuff. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it's, it's the a point. Different, it's a difference between being able being able to, to go to a library and being able to be able to select one book and be able to sit down and get some pa pad and paper and write your own. I think there's I think there's a difference. I'm not saying that there aren't some things that you might not like to have a drill and skill program. I can't think of any right offhand, but like, suppose you want to learn long division. Um, one way you can do it is be drilled and skilled to death learning long division. What is long division good for? Well, it's not clear, but one way to, one way to learn it is to understand it. One way to understand it is to write a series of actions that will do it for you. Okay, you get a tremendous reward there. Not only have you understood it better than, you, than anybody has ever understood long division before, so you have to cover every case, but you never have to do long division again yourself. <laughs> okay, you've got it on your dictionary. That's, there, I don't, the evidence shows that there's absolutely no lack. In fact, it's absolutely the opposite. The kids absolutely saturate the files of Papert's stuff with their own stuff. Kids are really verbs, not nouns, you know. It's really unfortunate that the word kid is applied to them. They're very least germans. <laughs> Peter, uh, could we turn to some of your reactions and move into that area? Well, I think that, that in the large, Alan's work and his talk indicates a line of research that could best be characterized as the exploration of, uh, of a medium. That is, what actually that medium is and what it might be capable of doing. And incidentally, in this work uh, comes along the production of experimental devices that form the focus of, of the work at various points in time. I think there's a tendency in our profession to look at this medium exploration in terms of the gadgets, the devices that might result from the exploration itself. And while I would be the last one to say that, that, that products in the form of devices would not be forthcoming, they well may, I think that it's probably an unfortunate, well, narrowing of one's view if one looks rigidly and exclusively at the devices themselves. Because in fact, uh, what anybody who works with a new medium comes to understand is that Developing a new medium, or in the process of developing a new medium, well, kind of to use uh, Professor Brody's terms this morning, what you're really doing is forging a new kind of stencil, a new kind of template, a new way to, to, to look at things. And I think that if I were to project on where the, let's say, short-term benefits of the exploration of the kinds of media that Alan is talking about, if I were to ask where it's going to come from, probably less from the devices than it is from the general conceptual framework in which the investigation proceeds. And I'd like to give you one very specific example because, uh, uh, well, one example that it seems to me is going to have will at least become visible in the field of English within the, next, within the next few years, and I think it's indicative of a number that are likely to come. There's a line of research with which I'm familiar that uh, starts in IBM's research division where uh, a group for a number of years in the mid-60s was charged with the responsibility to develop to explore the medium of computer-assisted instruction. And over the years, the uh, people in the, this IBM research group set about developing what they and uh, others as well uh, were referring to as drill and practice.
programs. Drill and practice programs were intended to be used as adjunct kinds of learning experiences where uh, more or less as a replacement of workbook activity, of drill activity. And there are a number of experiments in foreign language learning and uh, remedial English language skills, arithmetic, statistics, a number of them. A number of experiments uh, that it's, it seems to me, uh, experiments for which I think it could be said that the results are quite compelling. It's not a question of significance. The results are large. Well, no one hears too much about these things now, and I think very largely because the device by which this, this instructional technique was mediated happens to be an extremely costly one and has, for the time being, fallen out of, fallen out of sight. But there has been a line of research over the last three, four years that has started by analyzing the successes of the CAI experimentation and asked the question, well, why is it that it was? And the general conclusion has been that it works for a really a very simple reason. Namely, what this CAI was able to achieve was a, um, uh, a, a translation of apparently sound pedagogical theory into practice. Uh, the points that are made are, as far as this theory is concerned, that students learn at varying rates, that they can benefit from immediate and detailed feedback regarding the adequacy of their uh, performance, that they can benefit from tailored assignments based on some demonstrated need, and that their learning is somehow facilitated in a skills program if they're required to master one block of stuff before going on, on, on to the next. Recognizing that it was the computer as a medium that was able to uh, achieve this translation, this line of research simply asked the question, well, if this is what's going on here, why might it not be possible simply to devise paper and pencil techniques whereby you would have students working in pairs, a version of the, the buddy system with which teachers seem to be very familiar, a special version of the buddy system in which students provide immediate and selective correction, one for the other, where they provide, according to some pre-established routine, uh, tailored assignments based upon some evidence of how the kid they're working with is doing, and so on and so forth. In any event, there have now been a number of experiments, some more detailed than others, attempting to explore that simulation of a computer technique, and uh, the results have been every bit as striking. And my own feeling is that, that as these findings begin to be made known, what will become very clear is that from the point of view itself, there are potentially a great many enormous benefits that, that conceivably can be derived. And if I were to project, I would guess that, that, that over the next 10 years, that we're likely to see very substantial reformulations of instructional systems, the materials that support them, the formats of, uh, of the materials that are used, the, the systems of use in the classroom by which these materials are used. I have to argue that is from general perspective of point, or point of view of medium expression that, that Ellen and associates are currently engaged in. Can I summarize what you said? Um, I think what, what the major thing that was found out in CAI, as far as I've ever been able to read, was that instant response really, really works. Uh, and that's about all of, I really know about positive results in CAI. That is, students being tested with the same material, one on a teletype console and the other one with, with just the same material on paper. There's a, there's a remarkable difference between the two. It's the active return of the thing. Um, Peter has done an interesting thing uh, using kids to simulate this kind of thing. I think that the reason I came to this uh, conference 
was to try and get some ideas for how is it that you measure progress in stylistic kinds of things. That is, if your goal is not answers right per test or tests passed per year, but sort of measuring Sistine Chapel ceilings per lifetime <laughs> of, the, of the kid, how do you, how do you know you're, you're moving on towards that? And we've been trying to figure out ways of, of getting some idea whether the kid is developing his own style uh, by uh, through, let's just say through media. This isn't the, the exclusive medium that we use, but that's what we're interested in. And people who are interested in that, please write me. Uh, we have various groups on the West Coast thinking about that right now, but uh, nobody has, has come up with any brilliant ideas about how you measure style. Seems like the stylistic things, since the kid starts out with a lot of style, as they almost all do, and it gets gradually whittled away, it'd be interesting to know how to allow them to look at things from many different perspectives, including the one that they start out at, started out with, and still be able to, uh, let's say, integrate themselves in, into various aspects of the real world. Alan, I wonder if we might uh, turn to the audience. Our time is starting to get very short, but maybe we could take one or two questions from the audience before we have to stop. Is there anyone that would like to comment? Alan, I, I have two minor points, but I think they're and they don't really get at the medium question you're asking, but I think they get at some of the substance of what's in the medium. I think you've, you've made a, an assumption that's gotten us in trouble before, and that is that the process of reading that adults engage in is somehow similar to the process that children go through in learning to read. And, and you mentioned that specifically in the context of IPA. <clears throat> it's entirely possible that children have to engage in kinds of behaviors in learning to read that adults have long since given up on uh, because they are counterproductive to reading facilely. The other one is that the, something that we've been working on in Georgia for some time now with not any great success, but it's now clear to us that whatever a word means in pre-readers, Concepts is, is also very different from anything like the word. That is, the word, the concept word is really derived from print. And, and a word can be most effectively defined as a, a letter or a collection of letters with more space around it than it within it. When you talk about language then, and the reality then of what a word is in language, you come to, and particularly in terms of language acquisition, some very um, interesting ways that kids divide the world up and, and which we really know almost nothing about. Yeah, I, I, I believe that's, that second thing is true. The first one I'm not so sure about. The, the only reason I have that supposition is that, well, my brother is, is five years younger than, than I am. We both learned how to read at the age of two, apparently accidentally, and both of us read over 2,000 words a minute. And as far as we can tell, this is five years apart. The reason it happened was that our parents read to us every night aloud and ran their finger underneath the words. And we read almost before we could speak. And it was years later that we learned how to spell. Now, of course, taking two cases and running a generalization from that is kind of silly. But on the other hand, it is fast readers do uh, read that way. And it's not, see, the, the idea there is you're associating the kind of a thing that a kid can do already very fast. That is, he can hear a story. And he hears it whatever way he, whatever way he puts it together. He hears it as a stream of things that are like nouns and verbs. Okay, and sentences, utterances. But that's just a theory. I don't, I don't know. Now, could you comment upon this method of learning or the way in which this media is used, its effect upon uh, human interaction? Almost, um, we are so informal. When I say we, I mean the other groups, too, that are doing this kind of thing that was just discussed anybody who wanted concrete results. Um, most of us have a prejudice about getting a good intuitive feel for what's going on before we try and develop a theory. And we don't have that. Um, the basic differences in the kids after a couple of months doing this are a change from, in general, a, a very, I call it a noun-like way of looking at oneself being acted on by the outside to one of almost, and well, like one kid made a mistake in a program and gave it a grade of B when he started off. Because that's, you know, he's used to the one-time test. That's all the chance you get. Whereas, of course, you get chances over and over here. You can make, you can do something that's perfect. 
And after about a month, this sinks into the kids, and they get unbelievably cocky about their ability to do things. Even they're willing to attack anything because they've seen that few things can be pulled apart and understood. Okay, so the real effect, uh, the, the one concrete effect, and this is, I'm not basing any of the reasons I'm doing this. I'm doing this stuff because I like it. Um, the one concrete effect that is pointed to is that Papert's kids once did this for a year instead of their fifth grade, to the total exclusion of their fifth grade mathematics. They, at the end of that year, they took the standardized test in Massachusetts with the other fifth grade classes and just completely wiped them out. That is, the worst kid in Papert's class was better than the best kids. I might mention that Papert has only accepted kids in the, in the bottom two-thirds into his thing. He doesn't he has excluded exceptional kids that are measured by conventional means from doing this stuff because he doesn't want that kind of, you know, that, that kind of uh, uh, interaction, artifacts, creation. So, but really, the people who are doing it are doing it because they believe in it. As it's, you know, all of these educators or people who are interested in educators are just notably religious and, and the ones of us who are doing this are, are no different. You know, we just believe it's a good thing. We feel that the theory will fall out if we only were to do enough of it. But there just hasn't been enough done. So like I say, we're not solving anybody's problem here. Uh, however, if you know of a way to do, measure these stylistic things, we'd sure like to I say something. Is the, the kind of interrelationship that students would have with each other. When we talk in humanistic terms, what, uh, what are the implications of this upon the way in which kids will react to other people? And what kind of, human, what kind of adults are they going to grow up to be? Um, pretty chatty. The Papert's kids, and again, these are, this is the only con stuff that's really been done for long enough to say anything about, spend less than 20% of their time actually working at a console, doing something. They spend the rest of their time planning things out. One of the reasons we put it in this sketching quality graphics is we'd like the kids to be able to plan on it, you know, plan in a grungy kind of way, the way people do when they plan. But they spend their time planning and talking things over with other kids and acting out the kinds of things that they, you know, they, they assume various different perspectives. One is they're the thing that they're trying to manipulate and they go wandering around the room. Another thing is uh, that's sort of a reflexive kind of thing. Another thing is trying to articulate, which is the writing of the program. Now, now they're sort of a critic, okay, or a constructor. There are lots of different... Papert has done some clever things also. He happened to work the coordinate systems out so you can do uh, two-dimensional linear transformations completely without ever knowing about sine and cosine, which is a very nice thing. Now, the kids do learn linear transformations in fifth grade because they want to move... They want to make things of different sizes and they want to move them around on the screen. Okay, you don't have to know trig to do that, it turns out. That's just a side effect, though. Helen, I hate to interrupt, but I think our time is just about done. Thank you very much, and we'll stand adjourned.